Oh my goodness me, Kathy's been reading my talk. It does feel that uh, there's been a sense what Rich uh, brought in terms of the worship songs, what was prophesied uh, by each of the people, um, particularly obviously Andy and Kev, uh, just sort of seems to fit with uh, what I was talking about today, which is a great reassurance because I genuinely wasn't sure. In fact, I spent all of yesterday, Helen and I, looking at my talk, trying to work it out. She was telling me there were bits of it that I needed to change, and she was absolutely right. And so here we are, uh, as we continue these New Year reflections. At the very beginning of the year, we, I, I believe that we've been looking in different directions. Uh, so, for example, we started 2024 with 24 days of prayer, and... Uh, that concludes on Thursday with prayer and feasting here, uh, 7 for 7.30, uh, food and prayer, but not necessarily in that order. Um, so do come to that. Uh, also, the prayer room is now open and there's opportunities for people to sign in. Thank you so much. There are various people signing in, committing themselves just to spend an hour praying. We're absolutely thrilled about that. So there's still space. So let's continue with that. And so... Uh, when I talk about looking in directions, uh, that focus has been to look up. Uh, and looking to God is always and should always be our priority. The first Sunday of the new year, I encourage uh, us to look around. Uh, look around our Grace Church family as we talked about unity and diversity. Uh, and then last week, Helen challenged us to look in, look into our hearts as we seek the supernatural peace of God no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what's going on on the outside, the inner peace of God is the thing that we most need. And of course, also last week, we celebrated Roger's life. And of course, we looked back with sadness, but also with a great sense of gratitude and joy for the man that he was. And so we spent time looking up, looking around, uh, looking in and looking back. And today I want us to look forward and to look out. When I say look out, I mean look outwards, not look look out. I don't mean that. Uh, we were called to build from scratch. We were told, if you build it, they will come. That was a word that Neil gave to us right at the beginning. And God has been so, and, and Tim as well, it was confirmed twice. And, if, and, and we believe that God has been true to his word. And we believe, Helen and I believe that, uh, she's, she's poorly today and sends her apologies. But Helen and I believe that uh, he, he will continue to be so. He'll continue to be faithful to his word. We believe that people will continue to come to this place. Just what kathy has been praying. The people will come, that they will find God, that they will find that Jesus is their saviour, that they will acknowledge him to be the Lord of their lives, that they will become Christians. They will be born again. And so with that in mind, I want us to look at a very famous passage. This is the wrong PowerPoint, um, <laughs> which is a bit of a blow. So I wonder whether we can try and find a different one. It's the uh, dated today's date. Um, it might be on the, um, it might be on the, um, sorry, uh, the memory, I've got the memory stick. Andy's coming as well, who loaded it on. Um, so I will just read this passage. It's very, it's familiar enough for people. It's on the desktop, so that might help. Um, uh, yeah, let me just read it. People will catch up. You'll know the passage very well. It's John chapter 3. Some, might, some people might even have Bibles. I know these days that's not as fashionable as it used to be, but you might be able to switch your Bible on or turn, open your Bible, one or the other. Uh, and it's John 3 from verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, I declare, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Hooray. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, as surprised as I was that the PowerPoint was working. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. 
No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Kathy prayed that we would see people born again. And that's what we're going to think about and talk about to start with right now. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, some of you will hear, have heard some of it before. I'm hoping there's enough freshness in it. And some of us have never heard this. Um, and so uh, you're, you're in for a treat. So I, I don't know if, talking about being born again, I don't know if anyone saw the story this week of a little baby girl. She was found on the streets of London. She was less than an hour old. She was wrapped in a towel and she was then placed in a shopping bag and she was found uh, on the streets of East London in sub-zero temperatures. And uh, the report, the authority says she's doing well. She's doing okay. They've named her Elsa. Uh, the police were much more concerned about the welfare of her mother. And I don't know, I can't recall as if any update about that. But uh, what, it, what it did was it made me think, what a way to enter this world. And it made me realize how important the role of a midwife is. And what a blessing when someone is born, that there's someone present who knows what on earth to do, you know, who's experienced. And, and this led me to think of the significance of us being born again. And when we're born again, when we become Christians, and, and we know, don't we, that becoming a Christian is a sovereign and supernatural work of God. But it is good that as someone comes to him, as someone comes to Jesus, as someone is born again, they can be helped by people who know a little bit about what's going on. As they're born again, someone can, by God's grace and in God's grace, help that process to be a safe and a healthy process, if you like. What, what I'm saying is we don't want any spiritual else's. So I want us to think about the fact that as people become Christians, as they're born again, can we be competent as midwives? And you might say, well, that seems a strange thing to be talking about right at the beginning of the year. Well, the reason I'm doing that is because Helen and I and our leaders believe that over the next year, God will provide opportunities for many people in Grace Church to pray with people and see them come from death to life. See them give their lives to, to God. See them ask Jesus to take control as they respond to God's grace and great love for them. So, I just want us to be equipped and ready to do this well. So with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about a birth plan. But before I do, let's make one thing clear. Please don't miss this. The birth plan is about people who are coming to the point of wanting to follow God. We're not talking about grabbing people off the street and following some formula. Because I'm going to talk a bit about a bit about formula, but you know, as we pray for people and we help them to respond to God, we need to understand there's already a big relationship, a depth of relationship with those people that allows the conversations that I'm going to suggest we might have today. We also need to realize that no plan replaces the powerful love of God. There's no plan that does that. That love is sometimes shown through us as well as we uh, demonstrate care and kindness to those around us. We help them as they struggle and people are struggling with stuff. And that's sometimes why they're driven to God, because they're struggling with pain or abuse or loneliness or addiction. So many seeds are sown in lives before they come to fruition. They're sown in love, they're sown in tears, they're sown through prayer, they're sown through friendship and care. And all of this is absolutely vital, so, so important. And so this birth plan that I've named it is simply that. It is as that seed of faith bursts into life. Before people are born again, before they want to be a Christian, they almost certainly will have already encountered something of the love of God, something of the presence of God, something of the power of God. Many, many times before they've actually come and committed their life to him. So what I'm what I'm talking about, in effect, is the last part of the beginning of the process, if that makes sense. The last part of the process, which is the beginning of their new life. Just helping them to be clear about what's going on as they move, 
and this is it, I think, as they move from experiencing something of God's love to committing their lives to him. And the plan is something that maybe we can, we can, you know, might help us guide our thinking a little bit as people, as we talk to people about becoming a Christian. It's at that point where people come to us and say, I want to become a Christian. They're not quite sure what to do. I want to make sure that we are sure what to do. Uh, and so that's why I'm talking about it. So um, it's not some heavy set formula that we're putting on people. It's hopefully something we can just bank in our heads, which might be useful. Does that make sense? I'm keen that we don't sort of feel this is the answer to, you know, people's salvation, because that is actually Jesus. So, with this in mind, the very simple birth plan I'm proposing to you is very easy to remember, uh, and it looks like this, A, B, C, D. Some of you will have seen this before. Some of you are now groaning in with it, thinking, oh, sorry, I've heard this before. As well. Others of you are thinking, oh, I'd be like Paul, who was worked in evangelism previously. He's probably heard me bang on about this. Poor old Tim at the back has heard it 3,000 times. And yet, some of you may never have heard it. Uh, and I think it's not a bad thing. As I've been doing this, I felt refreshed by remembering. Let's just focus and bank in our heads how... This can help us. Admitting the problem, believing the solution, counting the cost, doing something about it. And within this birth plan, I'm just going to men mention scriptures. And dare I say, these are scriptures that might be worth memorizing. Oh, memorizing scriptures, whatever next. But there, there's not loads of them, but I think it will be useful for us to think about that. Also, I'm going to just tell some stories which actually I think may help when we're trying to help people understand faith and come to God. Uh, I've, I've told lots of stories to people over the time that I've been able to pray with them as they've become Christians. And no one has ever, ever said to me, when I've said, oh, can I just tell you a story about that? No one's ever said, oh, I don't want to hear your stupid story. They're actually very open. People love stories. And so I want us to look at these issues one by one, and we're going to start with admitting the problem. Now, I think, see what you make of this. I think people often uh, view their eternal destiny in this way. They think, uh, if, if there is a heaven, which is where they start, and I, if I get there, which is the next bit, and if, a, if God is there, he's probably there with a set of scales. And he puts all the good things I've done on one side, and all the bad things I've done on the other side. As long as the good outweigh the bad, I'm in. Just scraped in, just sneaked in. And I genuinely believe that that's how people often think. And so what they do, genuinely, they try to be more good than bad. But actually, that's not what the Bible says, is it? The Bible tells us in Romans 3, verse 23, all have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God, fall short of God's standard. And the Bible tells us that in our own strength, you and I, we can never be good enough. And sometimes people struggle to grasp this concept. Sometimes we need to find creative ways of helping people with that truth. And sometimes it's useful, I think, to use an illustration, because people will think they're not so bad. And what we're trying to do is convince them that like us, they, they, they're not quite there. Because you know, people look at terrorists and murderers and, uh, and rapists and dictators, and they think, oh, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. But actually, sometimes we can just use ways of helping people to understand that there's much more to it than that. And I want to encourage you that any person in Grace Church who is a regular attender in this place already has an illustration memorized that they can use to help people understand this concept. Everyone who's been here regularly already has it banked in their head, even though you probably don't realize it. And it's this. It's the imperfect heart. And if we dig down a little bit into the story of the imperfect heart, we help others understand that the imperfect heart speaks of the things that we do and say and think that are wrong. And I think this is really helpful personally because it puts us all in the same boat, doesn't it? I've got an imperfect heart, you've got an imperfect heart. And we're trying to connect with a perfect God and how can we do that? And so as we do that, these are the scriptures I encourage us perhaps to have in our minds and memorize maybe in Romans 3 23 you know we've got this perfect we've got this imperfect heart and that means that all of us fall short of God's standard 
And we're trying to work out how we can possibly exist in the perfect environment of heaven. And heaven, uh, Revelation 21, 27 tells us that heaven is a perfect place. Nothing imperfect can enter heaven. And so I'm just suggesting this one little example. And there are many others that I could talk about. But I'm just doing one at a time today. Just a little example of how we can help people understand that actually they really need to be saved. They need, therefore, to admit that there is a problem. That that sin that we sang about, I mean, Rich's songs were just so on it. I think death was arrested just struck me so, so relevant to what we're talking about today. And so uh, that really struck me that, uh, you know, that barrier is created by the stuff, by this imperfect heart, the barrier to a perfect God is created and we need, it has to be dealt with. You have heard it said that we really, as we try and understand what Jesus has done for us, we don't understand how good the good news is until we understand how bad the bad news is. But once people have got it, once they understand the problem, we can then explain that there is a solution which is wonderful. And so we move from A, admitting the problem, to B, believing the solution. And this is about sharing good news. This is exciting. We are telling people about God's wonderful love available for them. If the people in this room today are not sure of their faith, I'm telling you about God's wonderful love available for you even today. This is where we are properly sharing good news. And some people will struggle with this. I've had so many people talk to me and say, I'd love to become a Christian, but I just don't think I'm good enough. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, they're struggling with that concept. And, and so there's a helpful story that I uh, find useful to illustrate that actually none of us can make it on our own. Again, there are a number of stories like that. But I'm just going to tell one about a man who took his two young children to look at a mine, a tourist attraction, where um, they, they had guided tours around this mine. The little boy was eight years old, the little girl was five years old. And uh, the guide took them as part of the tour, he took them deep, deep into the recesses of the mine. And then he said he was going to turn the lights off, just to illustrate how dark and how silent it is in the bowels of the earth. And so he turns the lights off, and as he does that, after a few moments, the little girl, little five-year-old, she be becomes worried, she becomes agitated and increasingly anxious. And dad is about to intervene, but before he does, the little girl's eight-year-old brother says, don't worry, I know it's dark, but there is someone else who can turn on the light. I want us to think about that in the context of God as we struggle with the fact that we are so far short of God's perfection. We sometimes feel like we are floundering around. We're in the dark and the darkness of our world, in the context of hope that Andy shared, the darkness of our world feels so dark. There's so much pain and sadness and brokenness and abuse and once we understand how bad the bad news is, we can feel the level of anxiety, a bit like that girl in the mind. And the Bible tells us, doesn't it, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, the image of God. But then, of course, Jesus says, doesn't he, in, in John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. He will have the light of life. And so as we help people to move from A to B, as they admit the problem of the, the loneliness and the darkness and the isolation that comes with being separated and being distant and being far from God, we help them move to B, believing there is a solution. And there is only one solution. And we point to Jesus as the only solution. And this naturally moves us to talk about the cross. Jesus' death on the cross is the only thing that deals with the problem of sin. The Bible tells us this, and again, there are a couple of verses here I would encourage us to memorize. So John 3.16, many of us in the room have probably already memorized this one. 
because it is the probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. John, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so whoever believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. But then I really encourage you to think about 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins on the tree. That's the NIV version. But I really quite like the message version when I'm talking to people. He used his servant body to carry our sin to the cross so that we could be rid of sin. Really, you know, it's a powerful, powerful statement. The point of this is to make sure that pers- the people we're chatting with understand that Jesus' death on the cross completely and absolutely pays the price for all the things that they have done wrong. Every single thing. So once someone has A, admitted the problem, B, believed in the solution, then we can discuss the issue of C, counting the cost. And you know what? I sometimes ask people a question when I'm talking about that. I sometimes say to them, if you became a Christian today, what things about your life do you think would change in the future? Or even from today? I've often used the scripture I've put up there, Luke 14, verses 28 to 30, which I've not quoted there. Uh, it's where Jesus tells a story in the beautiful way that Jesus does. He tells a story about building a tower. And he talks about the foolishness of starting something without sort of counting the cost and being able to complete it. And, and I, I, like me, I, I, I think it's useful just to memorize, not necessarily that, that scripture word for word, but just the gist of it. And we can say to people, do you realize that Jesus told this story? And it's really important to understand about counting the cost. I just, as we talk about this, we can move into legalism. So let's just be clear. There are no hoops to jump through. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is a gift from God. There is nothing we can do to earn it. We cannot, in effect, going back to my previous illustration, we cannot turn the light on ourselves. We also know that the Christian faith, this is how I describe the Christian faith, particularly to those who have not yet become Christian. I say the Christian faith is a journey and then an event and then a journey. And as we enter into relationship with God, that's the event, he will do what a loving father does, and he'll put his finger on things that we need to sort out. But the point of this section, I think, is to double check that the response that people are making is not just some emotional response, but it is a response of the will. Praise God that he takes us as we are, as we come to him. In repentance and faith, we need to come to him. But we turn away from the past life. We realize that the Christian faith is actually about living in a new way. And as we draw close to a perfect, loving, heavenly Father, he is in the business of changing us. And so the point of this section is just to make sure people are up for that, that they're up for putting Jesus at the center, asking him to be in charge. Here's an illustration which I think helps get the message across. And I love stories, as you're probably aware. And this, this just struck me. See what you make of this. Imagine you've been given an all-expense-paid villa on the island of Capri, complete with airfare, you get a free brand new car and free food. All of this is not just for a week or a month, it's for life. How's that sounding? But to begin that life, you have to leave the old life behind. The old house, the old town, the old neighbours, the country, the, the nation perhaps you've always lived in, you've been brought up in. The benefits are wonderful, but actually there is a cost. The destination sounds beautiful, but to get there, you have to leave where you are currently living. Does that make sense in the context of faith? To get to the new country, you have to leave where you're currently living. In order to enter a new life, you have to leave an old life. Being born again means you have a brand new life, a brand new citizenship. We can't duck the issue. Do you know why we can't duck the issue? Because in our postmodern society, I believe that people are less concerned about God as a concept. They they used to think that wasn't true, but now they're much more up for that. But what they want is they prefer to have an experience than make a commitment. And we need to help them understand there is a difference. In this section, I want people to see 
that they need to be up for radical change in their lives. This is where repentance kicks in. This is where people think about Jesus not only as Saviour, but as Lord. And of course, this is in the context of the Father's loving care for us as he adopts us into his family. And then we begin to experience in the fullness his love, his peace, his goodness. And what we give up is nothing compared with what we gain. And so, if we've explained all of this to someone who's looking to God, if they have admitted the problem of their sin, if they have believed in this wonderful, wonderful solution, they've understood the good news. If they've understood that there's a cost and actually their life will never, ever be the same again, this is probably where we've reached D. It's time for them to do something about it. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, this is traditionally known as the prayer of commitment. And it is about committing our lives to God. And I've had the great privilege of praying with people many, many times. And I've got to be honest with you, I'm a bit pedantic about this. I don't like the phrase, I asked Jesus into my life. I prefer the phrase, I gave my life to Jesus. We're not asking Jesus into our life on our terms. We're giving our lives to him. We're submitting to him as Saviour and Lord. And had the great privilege often of praying for people. And sometimes they've prayed it themselves. Sometimes I've prayed and they've sort of prayed along, alongside me. It's just such a blessing. And what would we pray? Well, we would pray, sorry, thank you, and please. It's what we learn when we're kids. And we're being born again, so we have to learn it again. Sorry for my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Please, God, come and take control of my life. Be the centre of my life. Be the guide of my life. And so... Oh, there we are. A, B, C, D. Let me say something really important. This is one idea. If we look around the room, we will find many of us didn't commit our lives, most of us didn't commit our lives to God using this formula, or perhaps any formula. But guess what? We're still saved. We're still in relationship with our wonderful Heavenly Father, the one a relationship that will last for all eternity. And this A, B, C, D idea can imply some formal structure, and that's not the case at all. Please don't misunderstand me. It's going to be done very naturally as we talk to people, as we have a conversation, as we talk about faith. One area may be, need to be emphasized more than another. I, what I'm doing is simply submitting this to you, and the reason I'm doing that is this. This is a statement of faith, that we will have opportunities. And hopefully this banks a few things in our head that might help us with those opportunities, giving us some pointers about how we can serve people well as they join us in the family of God. I've had, as I say, so many wonderful experiences praying with people and seeing new birth happen before my very eyes. And our prayer is that many of us, many of us, will see many people come to Jesus over this next year. And I trust what I've brought today may be a little contribution to help us to do this well and be competent spiritual midwives for the glory of God. Amen. Let's... Thank you. I, I wonder whether I don't know, Janice, you're closest. Do you mind just telling Joe that we are done? I'd just like to pray first. But if you tell Joe, he can come as soon as he's ready. Well, sooner, really. Um, let's just spend a moment on the on the light in the light of all of this. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, I want to say thank you for the reality of salvation. Thank you that. Jesus, you talk about being born again.
not some crazy Americanized phrase and jargon. No offense to the Americans. But it's, it's your words, Jesus. New life. The old has gone, the new has come. And so I want to pray a couple of things. Firstly, I pray for each of us that we will have, firstly, opportunity, second, courage, and thirdly, wisdom and insight to help people come to faith. Secondly, though, I pray for anyone in this room, Father, who's not sure of their own faith. You might be sitting there thinking, what on earth was all this about? And I want to pray for them. And I want to encourage you, if, if you're in that category, just speak to either someone you came with, someone you're sat by, someone who you uh, are just connected with, or just speak to me, I'll be at the door. Let's just make sure you don't leave here without having that conversation. Father, I pray that you'll be stirring every heart, moving people into a place where relationship with you is their priority and their prize. And Father, I do thank you that you are sovereignly at work. Lord, we talked here about uh, being prepared, and that's my desire for each of us, that we're prepared, we're able to bring this to people. But we know you are sovereignly in charge. And it is by your revelation and by your sovereign power that people are confronted with your wonderful good news. And so most of all, above all of the thoughts and preparations and things we can bank in our head, above all of those things, Father, I'm asking for you to sovereignly intervene in the lives of many, many people, bringing revelation and truth to them so that they fall on their knees knowing they need to commit their lives to you. We pray for much fruit as we want to serve you in the harvest field for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being so attentive. I hope it's been helpful.